Our first speaker is Tom Keenan, <laughs> who is Professor of Comparative Literature and Director of the Human Rights Program at Bard. His research interests revolve around media and conflict, literary and political theory, humanitarianism and human rights, violence and politics. He's the author of Fables of Responsibility, Aberrations and Predicaments in Ethics and Politics, and the extraordinary Mengele Skull, The Event of Forensic Aesthetics with A.L. Weizmann in 2012 on forensics, eyewitness testimony, and the production of truth. Mengele Skull, for those of you who've read it, you'll remember, examines the transition in legal investigations um, and the production of human rights claims from testimony, the transition from testimony and human eyewitness to non-human um, objects, physical and digital materials, such as Mengele's skull as evidence in public forums. And I referred you to Professor Keenan's brilliant discussion of forensic aesthetics in Getting the Dead to Tell Me What Happened, Justice, Prosopopeia, and Forensic Afterlives. Tom Keenan is also co-editor of a book on new media, old media, a history and theory reader with Wendy Chun, and The Human Snapshot with Tirdat Sol Gadner, and The Flood of Rights with Samuel Mailik and Tirdat Sol Gadra, as well as The Ends of the Museum. And he was also a co-curator of um, anti-photojournalism. So please join me in welcoming Tom Keenan, whose title is Paradoxes of Recognition, how to make a refugee. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Devarti, and um, thanks to the team. I feel very well taken care of here. Um, and it's really nice to be among friends and make some new ones. So, and what a great um, project and subject to begin a new project with. Unless you're Egyptian, I think the CC thing might be you know, a little worrisome. Okay. Um, okay. This is cr a crude uh, free PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I begin, because I'm a uh, teacher at Bard, I have to begin with a quotation from Hannah Arendt. Um, it's entirely possible that the loss of home and political status can become identical with being expelled from humanity altogether. That's from the famous chapter on human rights and the nation state uh, in the origins of totalitarianism. Last summer, this is a picture I took. Last summer in Rome, I watched with some awe as a vast plume of smoke rose in the near distance, the black smoke of a seemingly huge fire that burned for hours and hours and covered the city in a haze. Later that day, I heard that it had been burning in what people called the Roma camp, not Roma like the city Roma, but rather an encampment of Roma people. As it turned out, that was incorrect, but the rumor was symptomatically interesting. Search the media for news of fires in Rome in the summer of 2022, and you'll quickly learn that just two weeks earlier, the Roma camp had been on fire, and not for the first time. 35 inhabitants were treated for smoke inhalation, and two were hospitalized. It was the latest in a series of fires in and around the camp, and it was easy to imagine that it would not be the last. Roma camp was an easy explanation for every smoke cloud over the city. The other day, teaching Aitan Gundugdu's excellent book, Rightlessness in an Age of Rights, I realized that my accidental encounter with this trope was a secret pathway into a longer and much darker story. Roma camp, was not just a nickname for recurrent disasters. It was the name of a human rights crime scene, one in which the perpetrators of the crime inadvertently allowed us to understand something basic about how rightlessness is produced and how it can be answered. These are the first sentences of the fourth chapter of her brilliant book, which if you haven't read it, you should just go and read it. On November 1st, 2007, Italy put into effect an emergency decree that allowed citizens of other EU states to be summarily expelled on the order of local prefects if they were judged to be a threat to public safety. The decree resulted from the public outrage following the rape and murder of an Italian woman, allegedly by a Roma immigrant. Drafted by the Italian government in an emergency session on October 31st, it came into force overnight 
And the next day, bulldozers started to level the shanty towns where Roma immigrants lived. Carlo Mosca, the prefect of Rome at the time, defended the decree by referring to the bestial nature of the crime. A hard line, he said, is needed because faced with animals, the only way to react is with maximum severity. The deportation order and the leveling of homes endeavored to remove the Roma immigrants from the political and social fabric of Italy. In addition, the statement of the prefect shows that such extreme measures cannot be taken without some kind of desubjectivation, to use Judith Butler's term, as the immigrants in question were rendered non-subjects, constituted as the less than human without entitlement to rights as the humanly unrecognizable. <clears throat> and thanks, Judith, for the quotation. The smoke that hung over the city that and other days was the sign then, not just of the fire and the destruction it caused, but of repeated destruction, destruction upon destruction, an ongoing erasure, and the renewed loss of home and status. The Roma camp just catches on fire, the inhabitants just as invisible as the cloud is prominent. At its core, the struggle for human rights begins in this situation in the placeless place occupied by members of the category that Arendt called the rightless. And it was her singular insight to begin the analysis of human rights and their perplexities, as she called them, not with those who have them, but with those who don't. Quote, once they left their homeland, they remained homeless. Once they left their state, they became stateless. Once they had been deprived of their human rights, they were rightless, the scum of the earth. This trail of displacements leads to the paradoxical situation in which the man who is nothing but a man is just one judgment or hard line shy of expulsion from humanity altogether, but becoming humanly unrecognizable. And there are others who were never even included in the first place, somehow preemptively or always already excluded, those born into enslavement, for instance. In both cases, the demand for rights is spoken then from the place of not having them, which is also to say of not counting or being counted as a rights holder, as a human being, place of non-recognition. So not even a place, exactly. The question then is how to make oneself count, how to emerge from invisibility or inaudibility, how to make a claim to membership or participation in one world from a position in what is effectively another world altogether, how to reorganize the world so that it includes you. In her analysis of the rights claiming strategies of undocumented migrants or the sans papier in France, Bundundu calls on an unusual word she learns from Arendt to describe this process. Quote, in the absence of prior authorization, sans papier have engaged in inventive practices to render their speech audible and intelligible position themselves as political subjects capable of making rights claims and establish the validity of these claims by wooing the consent of their interlocutors. And it turns out she didn't use that word wooing by accident because she goes back to it twice. <clears throat> she quotes the source of the notion. Unlike the objective validity of a scientific truth that compel us without any persuasion, I'm just gonna put that in brackets as a questionable consumption, but anyway. Um, a new rights claim can achieve its intersubjective validity by striving to woo or court the agreement of everyone else. And again, a few pages later, she writes that the actions of the sans papier underscore that new rights claims cannot have the irrefutable validity of mathematical truths. These claims are in need of representative practices that strive to woo or court the assent of others. So the word comes uh, from Arendt, woo and court. I realized teaching these passages uh, a couple of weeks ago, as I have many times before without paying enough attention to them, that this is a paper about wooing, about the indignity, but also the art, the performance of wooing. Wooing is an incredible word in English, by the way. It basically has no etymology. Mm -hmm. It has an old Norse word, which is basically like if I were to pronounce Wu in Old Norse, that would be it. And, and it has no cognates. It's like a totally singular <clears throat> word. Um, so about the indignity, but also the art, the performance of wooing. 
Does recognition, which is to say the radical emergence from structural invisibility, somehow depend on wooing? That's the implication of the passages that I read. Next image. More smoke, inadvertently more smoke. Wooing and courting involve, as she says, representative practices. Sometimes they can be demonstrative, demanding. One version of this could be seen on the bridge in Beijing, where Peng Lifa, quoting from the New York Times story, hung two protest banners on a highway crossover in central Beijing in mid-October. A visual and verbal claim that read in part, we don't want lies, we want dignity. We don't want leaders, we want elections. We don't want to be slaves, we want to be citizens. Another version could be read in a news account from 2015, the so-called summer of migration in Europe, about the Syrian family of Bashar al nasirat who said at the train station in Budapest where he was about to march to the border in broken English, we don't want to go to a camp, we pay our money to move on. We escaped from our country because our army was killing us and breaking us. So maybe better we stay in Syria, in our house, not to sleep on the floor. He said he's been invited to Germany and is desperate to get there. We are not animals, we are human. If they are human too, we need something. We need to know what will happen to us. Mr. al Nasserat was interviewed at the Budapest train station where another demonstrator carried a banner reading, your Zin Elk mention, we are humans too, or we're also humans. We're not animals, we're human. And we insist that this difference be recognized by those who already call themselves human. And in his quote, he's talking about talking to people, right? We need them. If they're human, they need to recognize that we are. The statement needs to be made because recognition is required and it can only come from others. We, they say, speaking to these others, we want to be treated differently by you, seen and heard in a new way, or seen and heard for the first time as something new. You treat us, or as if we were, you treat us as, or as if we were, animals. al Nasirat's compressed protest by sleeping on the floor and not having a sense of what will happen next in his life. And we want to move from that category to another. We need to claim this. Because our humanity, our humanity has vanished, because we are not treated as humans. The claim is necessary, but it only functions by asserting that what is missing, our humanity, is in fact already ours. We are already human, just like the others whom we address, but they do not see us or do not see us that way. The fact that it can vanish or never have appeared in the first place is what makes the claiming, verbal, sonic, visual, and the demonstrating essential. Humanity then, or the category of humanity, is not a baseline or a ground. It's a statement, a demand, a request, and an accomplishment when it's accepted, but it's a contingent one. These most obvious statements still need to be uttered and they need to be demonstrated, put into action, performed and materialized. Hence the protests, the, the, the hanging of the banner in addition to the statement that's on the banner. The enactment or the reappropriation of the capacity to flee and to move in the case of the big protests in 2015, the claim to space and to voice. The word claim comes from the Latin clamo, clamare, to shout, to cry out, to clamor. We could add maybe to woo. These are claims to what ought to go without saying, but in fact need to be said and seen. And they seek to put what is presently taken for granted, the line between human and not, which is also to say what is presently denied into contention, into negotiation up for grabs. Claiming that we are not slaves or that we are also humans is a matter of challenging the existing definition of membership, disputing the rules of inclusion, but it is not addressed to some external authority, some independent author of the rules of the game. The addressees are the players of the game who constitute the rules in playing it. And the claim seeks to change the rules of the game and the game and the makeup of the players. They need to be persuaded. We can read this in the little word to, so it's to and woo. 
we are also humans or we are humans too. In the comparison or the extension of the claim to equality, although where one sleeps on the floor or in a house and what one can imagine about one's future might seem to be the most private of matters, Mr. Al-Netzerat makes them public and political, disputes the fact that he presently denied that to which others have access. Claiming one's humanity is not simply to reassert ownership over something that one has lost, it is to dispute its definition, to put it in play, to challenge its monopolization by others, by addressing those others. There's no magic formula for this address. Wooing is situational rhetoric. It can be indignant, it can be undignified. Aaron spoke with scathing contempt in We Refugees of the upstarts and parvenus among her group of pre-war Jewish refugees with their tricks and jokes of adjustment and assimilation, according her. She sided with the pariahs, with, quote, those few refugees who insist on telling the truth, even to the point of indecency, which she puts in quotation marks, who get in exchange for their unpopularity one priceless advantage. History is no longer a closed book to them, and politics no longer the privilege of the Gentiles. Lindsay Stonebridge, in a reading of what she calls refugee style in Aaron's essay, brings this unexpected word indecency to our attention and takes us back to the exposure, the constitutive self-exposure of the claim or the demand. To seek to appear out of disappearance, to challenge one's vanishing, is a rupture, a break, an affront. Stonebridge writes, and she quotes Aaron, there seems to be no bridge, this is from the human condition, from the most radical subjectivity in which I am no longer recognizable to the outer world of life. Arendt is writing about the experience of pain, but that most radical subjectivity surely also recalls something of the plight of the refugee. Like the suffering body, the body of the refugee is not recognized by the outer world. To speak from within the subjectivity of the refugee then is to bring the concealed into public light which might be why Arendt chooses to describe such a telling as indecent. The indecency of refugee style, we might say, is the writing of the vanguard, a writing back into the public and political realms from the position of the stateless." End of quotation. How does one become recognizable? It may seem as if there's a vast gulf that separates the fierce bravery of the truth teller from the desperate quest for recognition. But Stonebridge shows us that indecency captures both the radicality of outspokenness and of unveiling, and even later we'll see undressing. The insistent demand that tries to con conjure into existence a bridge from invisibility and inaudibility to recognition or even membership, which is to say that claims the right to politics, such as that politics is no longer just the um, monopoly of the non-Jews. It claims the right to politics to wrest it away from those who have seized it as their exclusive privilege. One way of phrasing that claim is to say, we are also human beings. There is a difference, Aaron shows up, between taking this for granted, the dangerous folly, uh, the dangerous folly of those who fall back on being human as such in the hope that it will function as some sort of safety net, on the one hand, and on the other hand, having the courage to see that even human status must be asserted, demanded, and fought for, and that this is a political struggle, a struggle for politics itself. That was sort of a long preface to get you to this. In May 1999, the British artist Phil Collins shot a, shot a short film in the refugee camps on the Macedonia-Kosovo border that were then home to many of the hundreds of thousands of Kosovars spelled by Serbian troops and police before and during the NATO air campaign. He called it How to Make a Refugee, all uh, no caps, How to Make a Refugee. And in it, he demonstrates that in addition to the legal and political apparatus that constitutes some people as refugees, there is a photographic or mediatic or artistic one as well. Refugees are made by, among other things, cameras. Collins took his camera 
into the camps at Shadrane and Stenkovash and followed a group of journalists who were speaking with refugees, making testimonies, gathering evidence, and giving pictures. How to Make a Refugee is an unusual 12 minute portrayal of one such encounter between these journalists and their subjects. Packed into a small room with the journalists, there's a, a three person team, two journalists and a translator, and two families from Kosovo who number like 15. Collins's camera documents the visual and narrative practices by which the figure of the refugee is constructed. A journalist interviews through a translator, a 15 year old boy who tells the story of his family's flight from Kosovo and the violent interruptions of that journey by the Serbian police and the Macedonian border guards. While at the same time, the photographer takes pictures. The boy has been injured and when he takes, when asked, he takes off his shirt to reveal the stitches, closing what seemed to be a wound in his stomach, and lifts up his leg to show that it's been broken and is in a cast. He exhibits his body for the cameras as much as for the visitors. Flash bulbs are popping, people are moving around, a light meter is positioned in front of his face, the baseball cap is taken off and put back on, and Collins's camera Participating in the production without fully being part of it shows us not only his story and his injuries, but also their presentation and their documentation. It's a document of the document, an image of the making of an image. In the second part of the film, the action shifts from the boy's testimony to the larger group, and he shows us the somewhat awkward wrangling by the photographer of the boy's family and the other family with whom they are living onto a not large enough couch for a boot portrait. Once positioned, everyone smiles as their picture is taken, the crew packs up and leaves, and the film ends. No comment, no subtitles, a great document. So I'm gonna show you the first four minutes of it, and nothing horrible happens, but he does take off his shirt and shows you a wound, if that's, um, if you wanna cover your eyes for that. But that is, in fact, the whole point. <laughs> Oops, do we have audio? It's coming out of this, so. Yeah. 
I'm going to tell you what it's supposed to be. The film is generally interpreted as a critical expose of the tropes and strategies by which the news media constructs humanitarian or disaster narratives. It exposes the mechanisms of the exposure of suffering. The mise en scène, the framing of the story is brought into the frame and becomes the story itself. The soft violence of the making of the refugee by the cameras is laid bare. The refugees do not so much prevent themselves as submit themselves to be represented by others. One reviewer summarizes this line of interpretation as follows. Quote, each element comes together within the frame and the boy, at first identifiably human, vanishes into the image. The cliche, Muslim, rural, peasant, poor is accomplished. The subject is ready for consumption. This interpretation repeats the general theorem according to which refugees are or are made to be speechless emissaries in the much quoted words of Lisa Malky. An image of the vanishing of the, of the individual into the image. Surely this does happen. Humans do go missing, do disappear. That's what we're talking about today. A boy with a name and a life and an individual story is transferred into a status, an example, a type. The status is not a matter of fact, but something that needs to be accomplished. And here we see it happening, or so this reading goes, in a rather involuntary or even compulsory manner. The photographs taken then are a close, this is the prevailing um, line of interpretation of this, of this film, mm -hmm. which I'm gonna try to take a little distance from. The photographs taken then are a close cousin of the identification photograph or the mugshot. Not only the state constitutes subjects photographically, where refugees are concerned, we can see how the quasi-governmental power of the institutions of the so-called international community, like the UNHCR or the ICRC, humanitarian or human rights organizations, and the image-based media at work precisely where the state or even the strict sense is absent. It is not citizens who are being registered and constructed here, but refugees. Yet these images function in a very similar fashion to those on an identification card or a passport or any other institutional registry. They confer a status, sometimes a legal one, sometimes a political one, or sometimes simply a public or popular one. And that status can displace, swallow up, disfigure, and remake any prior identity. As Ariela Azule summarizes the process, a photograph of a refugee deprives the person who was forced to be a refugee of the chance to appear as a person who refuses to be evacuated from his homeland and become a refugee. The spectator is invited to acknowledge that person as forever refugee, since the spectator is assumed to come after the event was decided. This reading is not incorrect, but it's not entirely adequate either. As Tina Camp shows us in her readings of ID photos and mugshots and prison registries, quote, the unacceptable, unexceptional format of ID photos and the routinized nature of bureaucratic images frequently lead to a failure to read or a blanket dismissal of them altogether, as we are tempted to see only their success in capturing mute governmentalized subjects of the state, unquote. She instead encourages us to listen, that's her favorite word, to feel the force communicated in these images in what she calls their paradoxical capacity to rupture the sovereign gaze of the regimes that created them by refusing the very terms of photographic subjection they were engineered to produce. So my argument is gonna be in one sentence, both things are happening here, the subjection and the resistance or whatever we wanna call it, the, the attempt to transform it. And that's what I think is interesting. If it were only one or only the other, it would be totally uninteresting. But the fact that the one goes with the other or happens in the other is, the, is like the clue, the key to this, to this whole problem. So, Coincident with this production of the stereotyped and speechless refugee subject, there is also something else, something discordant going on here. 
I think we can see a claim being made and the making visible of the apparatus that constructs and transmits the claims. The refugee, 15 year old Bashir Haliti, speaks and tells a story, presents himself, not under conditions of his own choosing, but there are never conditions entirely of anybody's own choosing, but under the conditions that are necessary for his speech to be heard and the marks on his body to be seen. The photo shoot begins, this is what you watched, with the, and by the way, so the, he's, this is an art piece that shows in galleries all over the place. Um, never with subtitles, and the only translation is the is the spoken translation that you hear from the in situ translator. Uh, as far as I know, the number of Albanian speaking people who have seen this film is very minimal. So weirdly, nobody knows what's happening in the movie. So fortunately, I have a Kosovar student and we found out what's happening. The photo shoot begins with the journalist asking Bescher to take off his shirt to show the photographer where he was wounded. And one of the family members encouragingly comments about the journalists. I feel like I've seen them somewhere. The implication is that they are worth courting. Bescher's baseball cap is arranged on his head for the sake of the image. It's good with the hat on. Finally, he takes over. I will just tell you how it happened, he says in Albanian. We were coming back, and then we were caught by the Macedonian army. And then a relative interrupts to add, first we were caught by the Serbs. Bescher protests, yes, but I'm telling them about when we fell on the landmines. I'm not sure who stepped on it, but it threw us up in the air and we were wounded. A female, and that's the, that's the um, suture he has in his stomach. A female member of the family tells the translator, Sister, you should see his leg. And then Bashir, I left this part out, Bashir sticks up his leg and pulls up his pants and you see his entire leg is in a cast. After that, the event is swallowed by the logistics of the group photo, which involves an enumeration of the kinship relations among all the sister, all the sitters, who's the cousin, who's the uncle, who's the patriarch, et cetera, et cetera and the lengthy process of gathering around them all together into the frame of one photo. Right. They are comfortable with even inviting of the camera. This, this photo has been taken of them before at home or whatever, and they're doing it again for these foreigners. They're comfortable with even inviting of the camera and clearly familiar with the ritual of posing. Everyone look into the camera, says the translator, and the shoot is over. And they all pack up and they he put the, the journalist protests that he has some more people to interview and try to get out of here. The film shows us the operation of registration. It also shows us a performance, the appropriation or the reappropriation of the machinery of capture for another purpose. The terms of the encounter between Bescher and his family and those cameras and questioners are not fully set by the forces of those institutions. Participating in the ritual, Bescher can make something else out of it appear rather than disappear. So just the, the interpretations of the film are totally opposite, right? For the general line of thought, it's an image of his disappearance. I think there's also an, an appearance, a, a kind of wondrous appearance um, of this guy in the film. He could not do this on his own. He is not a fully autonomous actor. In fact, he's the farthest thing from a fully autonomous actor. Displaced, injured, the survivor of violence, later judged to be legally genocidal. He starts from a position of near invisibility or muteness. And literally, he begins the film, as you saw, not saying a word. But the situation imposed on him is also an opportunity afforded to him, and he takes advantage of it. Although the scene in which he finds himself situated is not designed for him, nor to serve his purposes, he makes something of it nonetheless. He acts as if he is a subject, not simply of mercy or pity, but a subject of rights, a subject who can make a claim, who can tell his story and present his evidence. On this reading, two incompatible and yet related subjects emerge during this encounter in something like a parallax effect. The one could not appear without the other. Bashir Haliti appears in a forum with strongly determined rules and conventions and procedures, with terms and conditions that cannot simply be ignored or broken, because they are constitutive of the space. Without playing by them, he cannot and does not appeal. 
but we see that he has the capacity to do something else with them too, not simply to obey them, but to enlist them in another project, another performance. The terms on which he is given the opportunity to appear can, it seems, be changed in the taking. Bescher knows we could say that evidence does not speak for itself. It needs transmitters, ventriloquists, translators, staging. So he turns what was supposed to be a unilateral encounter into a bilateral one. What we can imagine began as his more or less involuntary response to a summons becomes in the event itself reversed or refigured into something like a collaboration, asymmetrical to be sure, but nonetheless something done together in which the questioners and the photographers themselves are turned into the more or less involuntary facilitators of this subject's second subject's emergence. How to make a refugee then shows up both dimensions of Arendt's indecency or even a form of refugee style, the constitution of the refugee subject and its de and reconstitution, thanks to the camera. Collins shows up another dimension of this process a few years later in a very different film called, and I don't really speak Serbian, Zastown Govirim Srpski, Na Srpskom, Why I Don't Speak Serbian in Serbian, in which he returns to other parts of the, it's, a, it's an interview with all these Kosovars who were forced to speak Serbian, Kosovar politicians under, in Yugoslavia who were forced to conduct governmental business in Serbian. Um, and he, they don't have to speak Serbian anymore, and he goes and he interviews them in Serbian. Mm -hmm. um, about why they don't speak Serbian anymore. In the midst of a longer film composed of studio interviews shot in black and white, we find about five minutes of color film of the of, from this moment of the from the from the Bescher moment. Um, five minutes of color film of the camp's inhabitants going about their new daily lives, interrupted by, attracted by Collins's camera. Like the sit-down interviews, which are all very formal shots, they are portraits. Children and families playing, promenading, selling, building, eating, but most of all, posing. I'm going to give you just a little clip of that so that you can see that girl in all her glory. This is the refugee camp in which the house where he inter interviewed Bescher is located. You saw the flash and then she smiled. Okay, we can, I don't have any more pictures, so if you want to, do we want to look at my folders? <laughs> <laughs> you can just put that in. In an interview later, Collins recalled his time in those camps, and he surprises his interviewer with this claim. It sounds ridiculous now, and it is difficult for me not to romanticize the situation or my role within it. But I distinctly remember that not to take a picture would have been an insult. The interviewer says, not to take it? He says, every few minutes or every few steps I took, someone would say, take my picture. They wanted some marker as if this chaos needed to be recorded. 
even when I had no film left. Simply to take the picture without film was a necessary transaction which justified my presence there. Uh, it appears that the interviewer, it appears that some people were grateful to be filmed by you at a moment when it seemed like they were forgotten by the rest of the world, such as the little girl that stands still in front of the camera and starts smiling. He said, there was also a specific etiquette to the manner in which the relationships between them and myself were established. What is amazing to me is the way people stand still for the camera. It becomes almost like posing for a portrait as you would for a stills camera. He was shooting film, obviously. Posing or pausing tells us everything here. We can hear in the excited demand, take my picture, not just an instruction or an imperative, but a claim. Claim to visibility and audibility, a claim to appear and be recognized, claim to be counted and to matter. A primal sort of right is being articulated and enacted here. A right to claim rights in front of and thanks to the camera, in the very gesture of acting as if you have the right to have your picture taken. The camera opens a space for performance, even when there's no film left. Standing still for the camera is a way of making the camera stand still for you, of focusing its gaze, of taking over the space that it makes available. What better figure for this encounter in which registration reaches the zero degree and recognition or the techniques of recognition take over than the picture without film. It doesn't even need product. This is the beginning of an answer to the conundrum Collins discovered in the unexpected joy of the little girl in the camp and the self-exposure of Bashar Halidi. Yes, people in refugee camps stand still for other people with cameras because people who need to make claims need people to whom to make them and helpers to transmit those messages. Last section. But why do they have to prove anything, woo anyone, seek any recognition at all. Isn't that a double injustice? First, the lack of recognition, then redoubled by the necessity that the very cry for recognition has to come from the unrecognized one, that those who are not seen or heard must first make themselves seeable and hearable, and that they have to do it by seeking out, by beseeching the other for recognition. A number of contemporary scholars, leaders in developing a critical account of humanitarianism and human rights, have explored and denounced this double imposition. Mary McKickton, Didier Fassin, Nicola Perugini, among others. Their critique helps us understand much more clearly what is at stake in Bashar Halidi's self-exposure and in our indecency. So I'll end by turning to that. In his powerful account of the logic of contemporary humanitarianism, Hassan indignantly calls our attention to what he argues is a new fact of life in the helping professions. Quote, in the past, aid was given unconditionally, whereas now applicants are required to expose their suffering. End quote. This mandate that suffering be exposed, that claims be made, first through narrative and later through the testimony of the body, draws his critical attention. And in a rich ethnography of French domestic humanitarianism, he charts what he says are the demands for evidence, whether narrative or physical, that the authorities require of their supplicants. I quote, whether they are asylum seekers or foreigners seeking residence, poor people visiting clinics in disadvantaged neighborhoods or attending local job seeker centers, applicants for assistance from regional bodies or from humanitarian organizations. In other words, anyone from whom recognition of a right is never separated from a reminder of the debt to society that they are thus contracting, they are expected to produce the same narrative tropes and forms of arguments to justify their request, and the same procedures of evaluation and judgment are used to decide if they legitimately can be granted the precious commodities of residence permits, medical or social services, financial assistance, and debt rescheduling, in return for the gift of fragments of their life, they receive the counter gift of a means of survival. Amazing sentence and analysis. And sometimes even the story, the price of their story, he calls this the extraction of narrative, is not enough. Sometimes even the story is not enough. As his journey through the landscape of the asylum and refugee bureaucracy unfolds, 
he discovers the spaces where verbal testimony no longer suffices as proof of harm and hence of status. More and more often, the testimony of the body, its wounds or illnesses, speaks more loudly than that of the voice or narrative or corroborates. So, this form of exposing suffering is physical. It's the self-presentation of the wounded or injured or diseased body. Hopefully, if one can say that, sufficiently ill or injured so as to trigger the so-called humanitarian exception in French asylum law. Under these conditions, he writes, the asylum seekers accounts long the only evidence testifying to their story and justifying their request were no longer sufficient to confirm the truth of the alleged persecution. The body, which could have retained a trace of it, came to be seen as potentially providing tangible proofs. And this is the argument of his book, this escalating, um, uh, the escalating amounts of evidence and kinds of evidence that one has to produce to receive what ought to be considered a right or an entitlement in the first place. But Saint wishes this didn't have to happen. He's deeply concerned by what he sees as the displacement of a vocabulary of domination by one of misfortune, of injustice, by one of suffering, of violence, by one of trauma. So he's, he's charting the, the whole conceptual set of this refugee managing um, uh, apparatus. What ought to be unconditional now requires proof. What should be provided as a matter of right now is only offered in exchange for evidence. I'm not entirely convinced by the story of the golden age in which rights could simply be exercised at will. And sometimes neither is he. In one powerful passage, he seems to take the protest back. In fact, to reverse it and to, to discover in the ritual of testimony and the exposure of one suffering through another, both a basic ethics and even a politics of recognition of verification what we could call in what I've talked about in some other writing, a counter forensics, invoking the older sense of forensics as the presentation of evidence in a public debate or a dispute. For the medical doctors to whom the physical and narrative evidence of persecution was presented, Bassin says, I apologize for a long quote, but it's a good one, drawing up certificates that attest to those claims meant recognizing that this is what the doctors do, they write the certificates. Drawing up certificates attesting to those claims meant recognizing that the persons concerned had indeed suffered the violence they claimed to have endured. Not only were they listened to, they knew they had been heard. While those who have faced the extremes of horror have a painful experience of the unspeakable, they are also often confronted with an experience of the inaudible, which is no less harrowing. No one hears their account. Today, the dominant ethos of the authorities with regard to asylum is suspicion. Doubt is cast on stories, facts are disputed, evidence is dismissed. Convincing the doctor may therefore be a first and sometimes decisive step in the production of one's truth. The mark is no longer only on or in the body. It is present in a document that has legal value. The scriptural trace, whether it repeats the account or testifies to bodily traces, envelops the fragile words and invisible wounds of the asylum seeker in its legitimacy. Thus, writing does not have merely practical virtues. It also has a symbolic and hence political value of which the medical certificates remind us. Perhaps these doctors are somewhat like the journalists in Collins's film, amplifiers, transmitters, witnesses, helpers. They construct a space in which it may become possible to speak and be heard in which evidence might be presented, in the course of which new subjects might emerge out of silence and invisibility and erasure. You can't force another to see you or hear you, but you might be able to persuade them. The emergence from unrecognition or the exit from expulsion requires changing the manner in which the speech or image of the asylum seeker or refugee or camp denizen is received and evaluated. And the agency of that, the agent of that change has to be the speech or the image itself. It takes a performance to get you to see something you didn't know existed, to hear something where before there was just noise. Now, it's, I'm gonna do it too fast, and we can talk about it, but Gundugdu has a really interesting explanation of this phenomenon, following Arendt, who's following Kant. So I'm sorry, Kant is coming. <laughs> when we are judging a painting, we cannot evaluate it according, this is Gundugdu. 
When we are judging a painting, we cannot evaluate it according to a given standard of beauty because that painting expands what we understand of beauty in unpredictable ways. Reflective judgment, there's the Kant, is necessary when we can no longer appeal to past experience or an already existing standard. Arendt exists on the need to exercise this faculty, not simply for aesthetic objects. More important for her purposes are the new beginnings that strike us with their spontaneity and contingency. Here we can think of new rights claims that inaugurate radical, not radically novel understandings of equality and freedom. Any such claim works like an example in the Kantian sense. It is and remains a particular that in its very particularity reveals a generality that otherwise could not be defined. Now, it's a leap, but you can hear that in, I am a human too. Right? The two is the extension that takes you from my particularity and challenges you by saying that I'm a particular member of a larger set and you have to change your mind about what that set is to accommodate that particular. So that's the, this extension, it's like an extensionary theory of um, rights claiming. How do those who have no standing, whom we do not recognize as one of us, who do not count and do not even appear before us as fellow, fellow political subjects, how do they make themselves heard and attended to? Faced with exclusive definitions of humanity, which is straight, say, restrictive rules of interpretation about who or what counts as a member of the group, the unrecognizable have to make themselves recognized, have to change the rules of recognition. Artistry in representation is required here, techniques and strategy for changing perceptions, for shape shifting, all operated at the level of the example, the particularity of a claim to be part of something more general. The claim to not be a slave, not be an animal, to be a rights-bearing person with a status and a voice, a human being too, has at once to be uttered and to change the conditions that make it so difficult to hear. It has to reconstruct the criteria by which utterances like it are registered, create new criteria in the very act of being uttered, and in so doing, expand and reorder the space of the universe into which it enters. That painting, that certificate, that banner, that boy sitting on the sofa, all expand what we understand of humanity in an unpredictable way, precisely by showing us, by wooing us, to understand that we can no longer appeal to past experience or an already existing standard. To say we are humans too and be heard from the unrecognizably, an unrecognizably human is a monumental undertaking. And when it happens, the composition and shape of our universe change and we all change with it. Thank you.